Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Matt, and everybody here. When I saw, when I heard about the Analogical Mind Seminar, I couldn't help but look into it because uh, analogies as a research topic are actually near and dear to my heart. Before I studied computational sociology in my PhD, I actually studied cognitive linguistics, which many of you may know, actually rests a lot on the study of metaphors, analogy, and other figurative processes as a part of the scaffolding of, scaffolding of the mind. And so, where my research is going in the long run is actually trying to now synthesize these directions of research, the study of social networks, online experiments with the emergence and function of things like metaphors and analogies. I also want to make a brief note that unfortunately I was actually diagnosed with COVID two days ago and I'm still sort of carrying a bit of head fog. I didn't want to cancel because I was so excited to share my work with you all, but I Apologize in advance if uh, some of my my uh, COVID brain fog shows its uh, shows itself. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that is that coming through for people? Yep. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. So the question that underlies the research I'm going to be presenting you today is really the the question of how the structure of the social network, things like the topology and the size, can actually shape the kinds of categories that people form when communicating and seeking to develop categories to solve a variety of coordination problems. And coming at this from a sociological lens, one of the key themes that arises is the, the cultural centrality of categories. So there's a lot of work that has looked at how we need categories to Form a variety of functions in markets, such as assigning values to new cultural products. We can think of companies, technologies, and art forms that are emerging uh, in a novel manner on a regular basis, and we need categories to situate them in markets and evaluate them. So a good example is categorizing you know, new music uh, offerings in terms of their genre. We can think of all the music browsing apps, which are basically structured by genre and how we navigate these. Um, now, the way in which a lot of literature on sociolo sociology has developed to explore this topic has looked at cases where a category system already exists, so a way of classifying it to genres or way of classifying technologies in terms of their markets, and has looked at the consequences of how this is applied. And so one, you know, replicated uh, widespread result is what's been referred to as the illegitimacy discount, which is basically that if a new cultural product is difficult to categorize, people are less likely to adopt it, they're less likely to review it. If they review it, the reviews are more negative. And essentially it's that the, the absence of a category uh, is related to some uncertainty around how to evaluate the potential impact or value of this new cultural product. But as mentioned, this is a case where these category systems are assumed to exist, and then we can ask ourselves how do these cultural products, uh, to what degree do they fit within particular categories or uh, belong to multiple categories and exhibit some ambiguity. Really, the question that I'm looking to get at here is where do these new categories come from in the first place? You know, one of the chief uh, challenges in so that social systems have to manage is we have to come up with categories to make sense of a lot of the new stuff that both we are producing and that we encounter in the world. And this happens also retrospectively if we think of where did all of our category systems come from in the first place, the sort of social origins of these dynamics. And this is where I'm really excited to be talking to a crowd that uh, is rooted in developmental psychology and cognitive neuroscience in part because uh, categories, a study of categories is a really foundational topic in that literature. You know, I think if uh, Susan carries the origin of concepts, I really enjoyed that book. And some, some of these associations to that sort of literature actually appears here because um, no doubt you'll be familiar with there being two broad ways of thinking about where do categories come from. And uh, they're sort of at the intersection of cognitive science and social science. And this is sort of a theme that we'll be exploring uh, in the talk. So at a broad stroke, one way to think about the origins of social categ of categories is social constructivism. This is uh, basically situates categorization as a social process. It's something that people do when communicating together. Uh, we figure out and negotiate a shared like conventional system of labels that allows us to coordinate attention, coordinate references to the world, this sort of collaborative process to that, 
but by virtue of being this social collaborative process, there's also this argument that it can be context dependent, that there are problems of integrating different interpretations. And in that negotiation process, there are degrees of freedom. There are many ways it can possibly go, many possible systems of conventions. Actually, we think of like the game theory view of conventions. Some would argue there's arbitrarily many possible systems of conventions, right? And so as a result, we get this argument that actually communication can exhibit quote unquote path dependency. It can get social groups to many different possible category systems, depends on depending on how they communicate, when and where they're communicating, who they're communicating with. And then the data that's often used to support the social constructivist account is data of cross-cultural variation, differences in the kinds of meaning systems that people create. Now, this has been framed in debate with longstanding account uh, through cognitive science, you know, rooted in cognitive anthropology and various off, uh, offshoots of linguistics. Cognitive linguistics is namely this account of cognitive universals, which views categorization as largely an individual level process, thinks of the mental algorithms that people have for perceiving phenomena in the world, the sort of how we cluster together uh, phenomena based on sensory data, there being regularities in these mental algorithms and constraints that people are seeking to satisfy and doing that process or cognitive process of that. Things like hierarchy and other ways of optimizing partitions. And then the argument there is that these algorithms are largely conserved as a function of our biology or psychology um, due to perhaps similarities in developmental psychology. And the argument here is that, you know, this is an individual level bottom up sort of commonality that people people share. And then the data that's often used to support this is evidence of cross-cultural similarities of category systems, recurring sort of quote, what are we're referred to as lexical universals. And then people attempt to make arguments based on the presence of these lexical universals for fundamental shared cognitive processes that can underlie them. And I want to dig into this a bit more because it helps to illustrate the puzzle that I'm, I'm seeking to weigh in on. And I want to start by talking about this evidence for cross-cultural similarities in, in category systems. So here's a subset from a much broader list of uh, classification universals as they're referred to in cognitive anthropology. And this is from Donald Brown's work. And you know, this list has been taken quite seriously, you know, referenced uh, frequently by people like Steven Pinker and others. And, to see some examples here, these are these are domains where you know upwards of forty languages with quite distinct geographical uh, and linguistic histories have never nevertheless arrived at very similar ways, uh, very similar way uh, vocabularies for this domain. And obviously, the the surface form is not the same. They're not hitting on the same words. It's just similar groupings, like differentiating shrubs from trees, from you know birds from see uh, water life and these sorts of distinctions. And then when people learn the meaning of these words and decode them, they argue for similarities based on the kinds of distinctions that these vocabularies are drawing. So here are the domains of interest. Uh, there's a subset here to consider. We look at the first uh, four, they have some intuitive appeals. So we see geometry, flora, fauna, and body parts. And the reason why they have an intuitive appeal is because these have some sort of clear physical structure to them. We can imagine that certain dimensions or features are more salient to the mind that we that are sort of attractors for how we break things up. We can think of all the possible shapes we can posit. There's these strong gravitational pull towards things like the square and the triangle. And indeed, you see these sorts of uh, consistencies across these different languages. And so it really lends itself to this argument about what if there just are patterns in the world that are salient due to some natural information that's out there. And then due to the design of the human mind, we're just, just predisposed to lock on to some of these aspects or features. However, we see that the, there are indeed patterns of cross-cultural similarities in domains where there's a, the clear physicality starts to become more complicated, things like emotions, where there are many possible ways of decoding and reading emotions, not just facial expressions, other aspects of human behavior convey that. Also things like social activities, like eating and hunting and exercise, we see similarities there. And then more controversially, we see people actually drawing these arguments into the domains of gender and kinship and race. And a good example of the one kinship and race is an argument from the cognitive anthropologist Gil White, who actually argues that it's due to some 
innate modular uh, cognitive uh, process we have for species detection, which then gets mapped onto people and underlies the notion of race. And so it's this really sort of fundamentalist uh, argument for these mental algorithms that get bootstrapped and lead humans to arrive at very similar partitions. Now, there are many more examples here, but I highlight these to say not only is this argument uh, brought into domains of quite varying complexity and abstractness and uh, cultural or social re relevance, but it's that consistent across these, there's this, there's this argument that's levied, which is, well, what could possibly explain this amount of similarity given all the differences between these cultures in terms of their ge geography, their historical background, even the actual language they're using, what could possibly give rise to these sorts of similarities? And the argument is that, well, it must be something that's constant uh, throughout these human societies that people are bringing with them no matter where they go. So what is this unit of commonality that could account for this variation? And the argument is consistently psychobiology. And this has been made even more recently, such as the UNAL 2015 paper, which looks at similarities in the vocabularies of you know, over 40 languages and argues that this is evidence of some cognitive universals that are actually due, that are responsible for these uh, emergent similarities. And this is really what I want to push back on in this talk, which is to say, it's not that psychobiology isn't contributing, of course it's contributing considerably, but that we don't need it as the sole or exclusive explanation. In fact, social processes can also induce regularities amid cognitive diversity. So we can actually have a lot of variation cognitively, how people perceive and represent the world, but yet social processes can, can induce similar trajectories that can give rise to similar cross-cultural outcomes. So to help illustrate uh, how I'm approaching this problem, I wanna start by talking about the puzzle of category diversity, because one of the challenges that uh, that cognitive universals face, uh, that, that line of reasoning faces, is the presence of cognitive diversity and categorization that needs to be reconciled with these similarities. So if we look at some of the original experiments that actually tried to provide an individual level basis for the cognitive universals account, um, they were experiments, you know, some of the some of the most influential ones coming from Eleanor Roche. Of course, this is fantastic work and several aspects of Roche's uh, later work in particular sort of started to question and go beyond the universal hypothesis. So by no means is Roche exclusively associated with the cognitive universals account, but there was an argument made especially regarding some of these particularly influential initial studies, which had the following type of structure. So if you, you know, show a subset of stimuli and ask separate subjects, you know, which of these shapes is a square, separate individuals would make their choices and lo and behold, undergraduates at the same university would make roughly similar choices in these sorts of situations. You'd have them show possible furniture and say which one of these is the chair, clothes, which one of these is the sweater, so on and so forth. And the argument when these separate individuals with no in, like statistically independent individuals would make similar choices is basically that categorization is not an arbitrary product of historical accident or whim, but rather the result of universal psychological principles. So it's this uh, individual psychological explanation for these universals. Now, there are two, two challenges in terms of the extent to which this actually provides a full uh, justification or grounding for making sense of cross-cultural similarities. So one of them is that first, it was actually a relatively uh, simple stimuli set, only a finite set. We know that these uh, the types of phenomena that humans often have to categorize both in the origins of categorization systems, but also making sense of things that are emerging on the fly, like companies and art forms. We're actually dealing with high, high dimensional objects and really complex continua. And Roche herself recognizes and actually argued that her stimuli um, applied in that direction, said most categories, partition domains whose stimuli are not discrete but composed of continuous variation. So the suggestion was these sorts of psychological principles can nevertheless operate well in those environments. The other uh, is that uh, people in these sorts of situations were given a label they were familiar with. So which of these shapes is a square or a chair or a sweater? And so when we see similarities in how people are applying it, 
it's still unclear. Is that because they have some shared, you know, potentially innate representation that underlies the similarity? Or have they gone through a similar social process where they've learned to apply this familiar label in highly similar ways? So it's still underdetermined the extent to which social or cognitive forces are responsible for these regularities. Now, to illustrate some of these complexities, we can look at the experiments at the individual level where individuals actually categorize highly continuous novel objects with any labels of their choosing. And my favorite here is uh, Roger Shepard's work uh, where he would show these people these amorphous blobs and they could group them together with whatever labels they wish. And you'd see the same amorphous blob labeled as a tomahawk, a bird, a woman wearing a hat, a lion. This is just a, a subset of all the creative ways that people actually categorize the same you know, underspecified continuous variation. And while there were similarities in the kinds of groupings that people formed, it, it's sort of a foreground background phenomenon because there was actually also considerable variation as a function of the label that people used. And so this raises a question that when we see enormous cognitive variation or cognitive diversity present in how people will label and group together novel stimuli of this nature, how can we get separate groups arriving at similar categories in these novel domains? And as I mentioned, I think this applies both to the emergence of new phenomena, which we're having to make sense of, but also retrospectively in terms of where we get the category systems in the first place. And I think from the perspective of developmental psychology, I know that there's been an argument for a long time about the role of innate cognition, but there's a, the way in which this could situate within that argument as well as sort of the, the William James, the blooming buzzing confusion. There's this argument that children actually encounter early on the world in a much more continuous way. The distinctions are coarser, less fine grained, and it's only through the acquisition of language and experience of culture that more categorical boundaries are imposed on this blooming buzzing confusion. And so for that reason as well, we can think of how the origins of categories emerged if in early human cognition, we had so much continuity that we were facing to begin with. So the way in which this has been typically viewed in terms of the social constructivist argument is basically if we have a lot of diversity and the categories, different possible ways of categorizing the world, we actually expect groups to vary in how they categorize the world. So the vertical axis here is cross-group similarity, horizontal axis is the diversity of categories, and I'll explain why size of social group is there. But there are two basic reasons why this type of argument has been made. So one is that while there's more, pe more people in the group, we expect more diversity. This is just um, the way in which diversity of categories has tended to be operationalized. And this is where we see argument that larger populations actually have larger vocabularies, that the rate of linguistic innovation is higher, and that actually leads groups to vary. But there's also this argument that if there's more diversity in the population, there are more opportunities to diverge. There's a greater variety of possible categories that folks in the population could adopt, and this could actually send them down distinct trajectories. And this has been broadly discussed uh, in the, liter the theoretical literature on path dependence, there's also anthropological, linguistic anthropology work that actually makes a similar argument such as this uh, well-known paper by Owen, which are, compares the languages that small groups form versus large groups and makes similar arguments. Now, the challenge that I face with this is coming from having some training in theoretical biology and thinking about evolution, thinking, you know, one of the key takeaways that social scientists in particular often make when they uh, consider these arguments is that category formation in society is like the tip of the iceberg of complexity. Um, and it's one of the hardest things to predict. It might be fundamentally unpredictable. And this is used to support this strong social constructivist view that actually oh, at that scale, we just need qualitative research, uh, ethnography. It's actually really hard to get quantitative uh, grasp of the dynamics of like novel category formation and culture. Um, and there's, a, there's some extent to which that's correct in terms of understanding the subtlety of meaning. So, so I certainly value ethnographic work, but I was resistant to the idea that there are no things that we can predict about this space, that there are no aspects of stability or coherence. And from an evolutionary uh, biology standpoint, there are a variety of cases where actually increasing the noise 
or increasing randomness in the system can actually counterintuitively produce regularities at larger scales of resolution. So this is the argument that I made using those theories, and I'll provide you some of those reasons, where basically I arrived at the opposite hypothesis, where actually through an evolutionary model of category formation, we'd actually predict that as you increase the size of the social group and increase the diversity of categories that people form in that group, we would actually expect separate social groups to arrive at more similar categories. And uh, again, these are some of the reasons here uh, underlying this intuition. So the first actually comes from recent work on coordination dynamics in naming processes, where some work by my collaborators, uh, Damon Santola and Andre and Baron Kelly, they had what they call the name game, where basically the task that people face is all they have to do is they're given a face they've never seen before, and they just have to come to agree on some shared name for the face. And what they observed in the experiment were two distinct phases. Early on in the social network, when they're just matching with each other and pairing off with each other, there's a cacophony of names. Many, many names are bouncing around in the population. But people are incentivized to match on the assumption that one of the main things we're trying to do when communicating is to actually understand and coordinate with each other. And this pressure to match, they found actually drastically compressed the set of competing options. So you went from this large uh, set of names bouncing around to in a relatively short time span, uh, only a few options bouncing around in the population. And then in certain network topologies, they actually found that consistently the group would converge on a single shared name. And it just so happened that the topology that was best at doing that was the fully connected social network, which basically means the social network where each individual has the maximum number of contacts which wasn't exactly an argument about population size. It was more about manipulating the size of each individual's neighborhood, but it supported the intuition that perhaps in larger populations, you can actually induce these selection mechanisms, whereas you increase diversity, you actually start pushing the population towards converging on a small set of options. But this was a naming game in the sense that it could have been any old description for the face. It could have been an arbitrary string of characters. It didn't matter. Um, so it doesn't really tell us where they're going to land. And in fact, they found separate populations arrived at qualitatively different names. But in the categorization process, it act, there, are, there, are great, there are more constraints that tell us actually there are ways of landing in particular ways in the space. And because categorization, right, we have labels and we have things in the world that we're just mapping those labels to. And there are ways of grouping things together. What, what things are you going to consider common under a, a shared label or not? And so once we get that grouping aspect into it, we can then ask, well, we might have the compression towards a small set of competing options. But in terms of how things are grouping together, are those different convergence states actually similar? Are we getting separate groups to arrive at similar ways of grouping together phenomenon? What labels are they using to do that? And we can start considering and comparing cross-group similarity. Now, when I thought about extending this to categorization, there was additional work that led me to think that uh, we would see cross-group convergence as a function of population size and diversity. And this was some arguments actually made around grammar. It wasn't about categorization in particular, but there was this work by uh, Christensen and Chatter that actually looked at uh, the role that population size plays in amplifying weak population biases in grammar. So they found that at the individual level, while individuals can acquire a variety of possible grammars, there are some grammable grammars that are more learnable than others, or easier to acquire, or more likely to acquire. And while those biases are weak, in the sense that you can still acquire a wide variety of grammars, they found this correlation that the larger populations were disproportionately more likely to encode the grammars that were weakly preferred at the individual level. And this got me thinking, well, if a similar argument could be extended to categories where despite the possibility that many categories can arise and people can consider many possible categories, if some categories are even weakly preferred, then we could get the case that increasing population size is actually going to amplify the salience and the spread of those categories. And later on in the talk, we'll see that I provide some mathematical arguments around critical mass dynamics and diffusion that end up supporting that claim directly. And just as a brief note, one of the main evolutionary models that inspired this is the model of punctuated equilibrium, 
which is largely a statistical argument, but imagine something like the following. It's a case where you have uh, a large uh, species on a continent, and then some earthquake happens and you get an island that splits off. Uh, if only a very small number of members of that species end up on the island, you can get very distinct trajectories of evolution based on just the chance combination of alleles that happen to land in that statistical sample on the island. But as the population size on the island that, you know, happened to land on the island, uh, as that increases, the evolutionary trajectory that you predict actually increasingly stabilizes and becomes similar because you expect it's going to be driven by the alleles in the population that have some greater frequency. Um, so more greater likelihood of actually transmitting. So this is an example where actually as you increase the diversity of alleles on the island by because you have more members of the population. So just nominally speaking, there are many more alleles in the population. You also get this skewed distribution where some are slightly more frequent than others and you actually get increasingly similar evolutionary trajectories. So this model is actually what I mapped on to the categorization process and arrived at these predictions. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the experiment design where I used developed to test this. There is some modeling I'll touch a bit on that, but I want to focus on the experiment. And this is with the US subjects that I'll focus on. Go into the results, consider some possible objections. And then I want to talk about how we replicated this for a population of Mandarin speakers in China, and which allowed us to do cross-cultural comparisons that I find particularly interesting. And then conclusions, and I'd love to get thoughts and questions. So. This uh, research was published uh, last year, so I'm excited to uh, share the experimental design with you. So we thought, what would we need to test this? Well, we would need large social networks. We'd actually need some meaningful way of varying population size. We'd also want to be able to make sure that people are categorizing novel and continuous stimuli. So those two things are actually kind of tricky. There, there was a lot of research that actually had done a good job looking at categorizing novel stimuli like tanogram like studies or the Roger Shepard like blobs. However, uh, a lot of the paradigms that were based at the individual level or at most if they were social, they were dyadic, they would involve things like people actually pushing around tiles on a table, which you know we learned a lot from that, but it's quite difficult to scale that up to you know large populations for real time interaction. And that's really what really what we wanted to do is have that sort of categorization process in a larger social network where people are actually interacting to form categories. And to do this, uh, we built this online platform uh, called the grouping game, which I'll explain to you, which actually allowed us to test arbitrarily large populations. And these are the experimental conditions. People played this game for roughly over an hour. I'd be happy to talk about all the UX things we had to learn the hard way to make sure that M Turkers would actually be happy to stay in the game for an hour and pay attention. Um, certainly paying them well didn't hurt. Um, so M Turkers were randomized into five different conditions, either to participate in a grouping game in a dyad, a group of six, a group of eight, a group of 24, or the largest group size we had was 50. And the key thing here is there was no overlap in the participants in, in uh, across groups. So each dyad was distinct. Each group of 50 was a unique group of 50 folks. So there's actually statistically independent, unique populations. And this is what the uh, stimuli looked like. We basically created a continuous set by starting with like a Rorschach blot and then through gradual rotation. We could create arbitrarily many shapes along a linear continuum. So I'm showing you here slices of this continuum, um, which look like distinct forms, but you can imagine between each slice is a step-by-step -step transition that gets you from one state to the other. And what's nice about this is we actually didn't have any a priori perceptions about what the groups were going to be. We genuinely got to give it to folks and just see what boundaries or groupings were intuitive to them. And you could then compare them in terms of the labels and partitions that they created on this continuum. The continuum in total uh, consisted of 1500 images. Now the game logic uh, was a pairwise game. So uh, in a given round, uh, each person would play with one other person. Um, in the dyad, you'd be playing with the same person back and forth. So if, if Matt and I were in a dyad, we'd just be playing back and forth the whole game. 
But if we were in a larger population, then while Matt and I might play on round one, on round two, we are randomly connected to somebody else in the population to play with. So Margarita and I might play next. And this creates the possibility for a diffusion process because Matt might use a category with me that I like and we coordinate on it. And then now I'm interacting with Margarita and I use this label with her and then she adopts the label, so on and so forth. Now, as a simplifying assumption in these networks, uh, anyone could be randomly paired with anybody else. So they were homogeneous, homogeneously mixing, fully connected. And that was the cleanest way of testing the hypothesis argument, uh, the population size argument. But in ongoing work, I am actually testing the effects of different network structures on this category formation process. So crucially, on each round, each person was randomized to be either a speaker or a hearer. They were shown a random subset of three images from the continuum. The system, if you were a speaker, the system would randomly highlight one of them. So say this shape here, and it would say, ask your partner to click on this shape by sending them a label. So they could type in anything they wanted. So let's say you type in baby. I don't know what kind of baby you have in mind, but let's say you type in baby. Um, now, if you're a hearer, you see the same three shapes, but the order is randomly changed. So you can't just say left. You can't just say right. You're going to get the label baby and you have to make an inference. Which of these shapes is the speaker actually referring to? If you click on the correct shape, you get told it's a match. Hooray. Um, you get a monetary reward. That's how they made their money. Uh, you go back into the game. If you didn't match, you got a slight monetary punishment and you were told the shape that the speaker was actually intending to refer to. And I'm happy to talk more about the incentive structure here. It's pretty canonical in terms of social learning paradigms. So with respect to that literature, there's nothing that new happening here. But I do broadly think that it's quite interesting to think about different incentive structures here. So ha happen to talk more about that. But the basic assumption here is people are trying to coordinate as the paradigmatic uh, dynamic of communication. So uh, additional things I wanted to say here is that um, a crucial thing is, first of all, no one was told anything about the population size that they were in. The instructions were all exactly the same. So there's no effect of like what people happen to believe changed the way that they formed categories. And in fact, at the end of the task, we asked them, how many people do you think you were interacting with? And people were actually surprisingly kind of bad at that. And there were no major differences across conditions. So for our purposes as a control variable, that's great. And the second thing is that the way that we designed this to elicit a categorization process proper was that actually the system was designed to show unique shapes every round. So if I saw the first set of three shapes, the next time, the next round, it would sample another set of three. And that's important because if I use the same label on subsequent rounds, like baby, and then I keep using baby, I'm actually seeing different shapes. So I'm generalizing on the basis of similarities um, according to the membership of that label. That was a way for us to bake in this uh, generalization process. So now I'm gonna go into the results. Um, and the way I'm gonna present the results, it's actually gonna compare the category systems of different groups side by side. So this is the category system of one group. The horizontal axis here is the continuum. I'm just showing you slices like subsets of the shapes just as a, as a queue, but it's a continuous uh, dimension for all 1500 shapes. The density distribution show where this particular dyad coordinated most successfully on the use of the label. And then the color is actually going to correspond to the labels themselves. So again, this is the category system for a particular dyad. What you see with the label hockey is you see the shapes that look like a stick and a puck for those of you who are familiar with hockey. That's how what the set of shapes that they're actually referring to is hockey. Then you have the label hug, which they're using to refer to shapes in that range. And then sit, of course. Now, what it means that there's uh, empty space is actually that this diet didn't manage to successfully establish a label within that range. They just couldn't coordinate. Because another key component of this is all shapes were shown in a randomly uniform manner. There was no bias in terms of where on the continuum they were more likely to see shapes. It was equally likely across the continuum. So they were given ample opportunities to establish a label, a shared category for shapes in that region. They just couldn't figure, they just couldn't come to agree. So what we can do with this paradigm is actually stack and actually compare the category systems qualitatively as separate dyads. That's what we're doing here. 
as an example, so this is a different dyad. And what I love about this is we see variation, not only in terms of which labels they use, but also where in the continuum they successfully uh, categorize. And I like if we look at uh, the, the first diet use the label sit. And for the same reason, the other label, the other diet uses almost the opposite label fly in terms of negative and positive space. The one is on the ground, the other one's in the air. We also see in the first diet where they couldn't figure out what was going on in that region. The second diet actually converged on the label man. Uh, so they figured out a way to coordinate on that. We can proceed and see variation also in terms of how many labels they ended up successfully converging on. Um, I'm happy to talk more about how we measured that. It's just a standard clustering approach where we looked at which labels actually were associated with coordination success and adoption, and a subset consistently takes off in each dyad. Uh, and then we see variation also. Sometimes we see nouns, but then occasionally we see them actually adopting comparatives like tall as a way of coordinating. So the variety of possible strategies. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you 10 different dyads side by side. And what we see is in a, in a considerable amount of variation, actually. I could show you more, but it starts to be a bit visually overwhelming, like an Anonymous Bosch painting or something like that. Um, but there's considerable variation, again, in which labels they are using for the same region of the continuum, but also which regions of the continuum are actually like the low side for categorization. Across these 10 dyads, there's actually 40 unique labels, which is about four distinct labels per dyad. So I want to bring us back to the hypotheses of social constructivism versus cognitive universals. Basically, this is uh, show, suggesting that certainly the cognitive use of universal account is underspecified in these highly continuous novel environments where indeed there's a considerable amount of variation and creativity that individuals can exhibit when categorizing. But then to the social constructivist account, we can see so much variation, like a basically a cacophony of possible descriptions. What do we expect if we actually increase population size? So now you're interacting with 49 other people, we actually expect there to be a sea of variation that you're facing. And that uh, with that greater diversity, we'd expect there to be more opportunities to diverge group. One group hits on category A initially, which then leads them to a different category subsequently, and they get down a unique trajectory, whereas adopting a different label early on leads this uh, different group down a different trajectory. So we'd expect this path dependent cross group variation. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the category systems of separate populations of 50 side by side. And I'm gonna show you actually all populations of 50. Each row is the category system for a distinct population of 50 people. Again, no overlap between them. And what we see is a striking amount of similarity in the category systems that separate groups of 50 developed. In fact, every single separate population of 50 people arrived at the label crab for a highly similar region of the continuum. About 80% of them converged on the label frog. What I think is fascinating is you see there are cases where a light blue distribution is overlapped by a gray one, but that's actually between bunny and rabbit. I show both of those there to actually say that both labels were actually competing within each population, so we could see them. Consistently, bunny ends up taking off, but it's really cool to see that the synonym rabbit was actually literally in some sort of race with the bunny and the populations. Now, the argument I'm focusing on here is actually emphasizing the similarity, the cross-cultural, the cross-group convergence here. I, of course, there's also variation across the populations. They didn't perfectly converge. Um, we see that there are regions of the continuum where they're more likely to categorize or converge than others. And I have a current uh, RNR at the American Journal of Sociology, which is focusing on predicting actually where large populations are more likely to form their categories. And, I'll just give you a bit of a, a preview that it actually can measure properties of the ambiguity of images, which ends up helping predict where they're most likely to form their categories, where they're most likely to diverge, but happy to save that for follow-up discussion. So here we see that there is this considerable convergence. And so if we step back again, so here our horizontal axis is category diversity, the number of categories that are encountered by each player. And the vertical axis is the cross-group similarity. The vocabulary is this is just measured using the Jacquard index. 
Um, the traditional prediction from the social constructivist account is greater diversity and variations, going to be lots of different outcomes. Now I'm going to show our, the, our data. And so the points here is like each dyad's average vocabulary similarity to every other dyad. And what we see by increasing population size, we systematically increase the similarity of the vocabularies that form across these populations. And this is just to say we can put this side by side with uh, the agent-based model we use to develop these hypotheses, and we can actually fit the same curve really nicely to these outcomes. And I want to talk a bit about the theory now that went into uh, what makes sense of these results, you know, what went into the model that allowed these predictions to be possible. And basically, it was building in this bias parameter that some categories are more likely to form than others, and then expecting those to be amplified in the large groups. So I want to talk a bit about that now. So if we look at, this is the baseline likelihood of a category being originated, right? Remember, folks could come up with whatever they want, but we can ask, like, how many folks independently originated a given label? And what we see is a very clear Ziffian distribution. Um, I mean, as some of you have worked with Ziff, you know, the, high, the power parameter gets tweaked a bit, but, at, you know, 1.3, whatever, it's within the range of uh, Ziffian distributions. And basically what we see is there were some subset of labels like crab and bunny that were much more likely to be independently originated, you know, just uh, commonsensically like around between 20 and 35% of the population independently originated. But what's interesting with such heavy tail distributions is actually the vast majority of the time labels are unique. So they're being originated by one person or two or three people across the entire population. So we see labels like sumo that were distinct. And basically the argument is that these rare labels or idiosyncratic labels are more likely to drive the dynamics in the small populations. Whereas in the large populations, these more salient uh, options actually have a competitive edge once they're competing against most labels that are introduced by only a small number of people. But we can actually provide some mechanistic reasoning here. So this is a critical mass theory of the spread of linguistic conventions, which argues in this uh, paper by my collaborator, Damon Santola, showed that actually once 25% of the population is introducing a particular linguistic convention, you can reach a tipping point and actually get it to spread to the rest of the population. And so what I had asked myself is what is the likelihood based on the categories that people are originating, what is the likelihood that a given label reaches critical mass and spreads? Because what we'd hope to see is that consistent critical mass dynamics are happening across these populations and that that's actually contributing to the similarity. And just as a bit of a the mathematical intuition here, partly because I, I think it's fascinating, is the way that I modeled this was actually by drawing from in probability theory, what's called the birthday paradox. And this is, what is the probability that two randomly sampled people have the same birthday? Well, it's really low if you just take two random folks. Um, but if you ask, what is the probability that two people share the same birthday within a constrained sample size? So say, what are the probability that two people share the same birthday within this Zoom room, it actually starts to increase considerably. And once the group that you're sampling within approximates roughly a population size of 50, you become almost, almost mathematically guaranteed that two people in that population have the same birthday. It's framed as a paradox because it should be unlikely, but just due by, to random uh, reference size alone, you can basically go from random to mathematically guaranteed. And so my thinking was, Rather than one of the, what's the probability that two people share a birthday, it's what's the probability that two people introduce the same category. But now rather than it just being two, I'm interested in whether a critical mass of, what is the probability that a critical mass of people introduce the same category, allowing it to spread. And we don't have to get into the nitty gritty here, but it ends up being a hypergeometric distribution. And you can basically ask, what's the probability that at least K or 25% of people independently introduce a label? And what you see is that in the dyads, you know, you can, we can control for the baseline likelihood of a given label showing up. Uh, so if it's one of the common popular ones or salient ones, it's going to be like, you know, 35%, 40% or whatever. Um, then the rare ones have like, you know, just a very low probability of showing up. Basically, in the smaller populations, 
uh, the likelihood of either of those labels, whether they're rare or common, reaching critical mass is actually similar. And here's one way to put it, right? Like in a dyad, every label reaches critical mass. Exactly half the population introduces the label. And that's independent of whether in the grand scheme of things, it's an idiosyncratic or a common label, right? But then if we start going into larger populations, what is the probability that one of these idiosyncratic label is introduced by you know, a meaningful fraction of the population, but becomes astronomically low? Whereas the common labels, they retain their baseline frequency and actually increasing the population just does a better job of estimating that baseline frequency. And so that they actually increase in their likelihood of reaching critical mass. So you see this bifurcation as we increase population size between the likelihood that a rare or common label actually reaches critical mass. Um, this is just showing here, we can estimate that with our data and it fits the trend quite nicely. And just following on this logic, that's what this plot here shows. It's like, what's the correlation between the initial frequency of a category in a population and then the frequency of people who adopted it? This holds whether you look at just numerical or fractions and indeed, you see there's no correlation in the dyad because every single every single label re is introduced by exactly half. But then as we increase population size, basically the correlation between the frequency at which a label is introduced uh, significantly, like drastically correlates with the frequency of people who end up adopting it. And this is where we get this differential privileging of these frequent labels in terms of their likelihood of spreading. And so some of you are familiar with the evolutionary framework. Uh, this is a kind of frequency dependent selection, but with a diffusion spin put on it from peer to peer spreading. And just because I couldn't help, uh, given that this is a very explicitly about analogical minds, um, of course, if we looked at the labels themselves, given that these are abstract blobs, you know, every, if, if you're thinking of the Hofstadter like sense, every single category here is an analogy. But certainly we can see in the creativity exhibited, there are cross-domain mappings, like seeing this blob or we're calling it a crab. We're basically computing some sort of similarity between this you know, amorphous shape and some sort of referent we have for crab. I'm inclined to call that a kind of an analogy that's being formed. We can think of what kinds of analogies are more likely to show up in these salient baseline labels. And some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, the Bracebert sort of rating of concepts in terms of their concreteness. And I just thought it would be fun for this group to mention. It's not in the main paper, but of course we can score all of the labels that people produced in terms of their concreteness. And it turns out um, in terms of the average concreteness of the category systems that end up getting adopted, we see that in the networks, the large networks, those category systems are significantly more concrete than the smaller groups. Uh, and that we can actually look at the baseline likelihood of a label being adopted. And in this task, uh, increasing concreteness actually increases the likelihood that the label is adopted, which suggests that as, as analogies go, anchoring and sort of shared common reference and concreteness is actually has a coordination advantage. So I wanna think about possible objections to what's going on here. And certainly when we think about something like concreteness, it suggests that, you know, what if there's just some labels that are inherently better than others this is uh, one of the main objections here is a sort of intrinsic appeal of certain categories. And the reason why this could be an objection, which is like, well, if some labels are just better than others, what if increasing population size just increases your likelihood of getting those better labels and then they'll spread? So certainly I think cognitive dimensions of the labels matters here, but my argument is that actually the social dynamic plays a really key role too. So one way to illustrate that is if we look at which label would have the status as being the best? That's crab, right? Because it was adopted by every single large network. Now we can look at when the dyads themselves even attempted the label crab for the crabbiest region. So which region of the continuum was most often labeled as crab? We actually see in the networks that every time it, that crabbiest region uh, was labeled crab, whereas in the dyads, we could say even when they tried, one of the members tried to use the label crab for that region, what label did they end up adopting? And crab often failed, and we would see hot dog, hulk, baby, car, smile, flat, sumo, boat. So a considerable variation, even in the midst of being exposed to what would otherwise be considered the, the quote-unquote best label in terms of description. 
Now, this then leads to the counterfactual. Well, you know, this this is this analysis certainly su is suggestive that the cognitive features of the label alone aren't sufficient. But the argument is, well, could you then take one of these idiosyncratic labels and actually rig it and actually give them that critical mass? Could you actually get a population to adopt it? Um, so that's what we did. We took the rare label SUMO and we designed what we called the SUMO trials. So in these, we had 37% of the network of 24 were Confederates who actually pushed the label SUMO instead of the label CRAB when images from the CRAB region appeared. Um, indeed, we see in this particular network that the label CRAB appeared. This is the data only among the, sub, the human subjects. CRAB appeared, but by the end of the task, actually a greater fraction of subjects adopted the label SUMO. And we can look at how often they were actually using this label to coordinate, communicate with each other. We actually see why roughly halfway through the experiment, SUMO is taking off and then more frequently using this label to communicate with each other. And then we proceeded to replicate this six times, six separate networks of 24. Now, as far as analogies go, my claim is not that we could do this for any possible description. I actually, have, my current work is showing that populations are not infinitely malleable. Some association, it has to have some proximity to the stimuli. But I think the argument is actually that the degrees of freedom are fairly high. There is a wide range of possible descriptions or analogies that can actually support effective coordination. So as long as the coordination access is not a stark split when only one or two are capable of coordinating and others are not. And within that gradient, within that range of functional, basically functional analogies, we can get a wide range of populations to take off. It happens that some are given a critical mass for free due to cognitive salience. But if that is changed due to cultural factors or other factors, you could actually get other analogies to take off as well, which gets you into the questions also cultural differences, what I'll get into now with the Mandarin study, but also strategic communication and how organizations and other features of social dynamics can actually skew towards certain analogies rather than others as a function of incentives and strategy and so on. So in thinking about that baseline distribution, one way to think about the cross-cultural impact is, you know, does this actually hold when you look at other cultures? Because one possibility is what if that salience distribution was something special about the US population, but you might go into other populations where we don't have that kind of critical mass distribution. So certainly my theory is that if there's no skew, if there are no categories are more likely to appear than others, then the model actually suggests you can get sort of radical social constructivism. And there might be domains where that's true. My my request would be to find that and show that a given domain has that property, because if the domain has uh, certain associations or descriptions that are in fact more likely than others, even if they're the minority, then you can get these amplification effects and communication networks. And so one way to look at that is we're gonna look at the Mandarin population, and these were actually folks in China uh, who took this task online. So here we're looking at the dyads in the Chinese population. And we see, again, a stark amount of variation, roughly the same number of unique labels to each group. And so again, we see uh, quite a bit of creativity and variation between dyads and how they're describing the, the stimuli. But then we can look at the separate di uh, large populations. And so here, 10 of these are groups of 24, and there's one group of 50 Mandarin population. And we see convergence dynamics comparable to what we see in the US population. So but separate networks of Mandarin speakers have arrived at much more similar category systems. And remarkably, they've each arrived at the label, the Mandarin label crab for basically the same region of the continuum that the US population arrived at. So we literally are observing the cross-cultural replication uh, in the formation of this category system. But something that I think is interesting is there are convergence towards labels that the US population did not converge toward. So we see the label that translates to something like meditation, which the US populations didn't even produce at all as a baseline. They produced yoga and occasionally that was adopted, but it did not exhibit the level of cross-group convergence that the label meditation did. So here we get into somewhat of a mixed account. Basically at a broad scale, these statistical dynamics are replicating across populations. Um, and there are certain cases like this one where that means separate cultures will arrive at very similar category systems. 
And on the point of concreteness, we see obviously a label like crab has a sort of baseline, basic concreteness, and it's part of the natural world everyone's roughly exposed to. And so that can reliably solve this coordination problem across groups. But then there could be certain aspects of the category distribution that are altered by cultural backgrounds. So certain associations can be more salient than others, like meditation, uh, and other kinds of descriptions, like uh, you know, one of them is uh, pliers or handstand, which were just more available to the Mandarin speakers. And so that now is actually some, one of the options that they can converge on, which can actually lead to cross-cultural divergence, despite the fact that the actual statistical influence dynamics are actually exhibiting some universality. And this is just one quick way to say that we can actually use um, ConceptNet, which is this embedding framework for looking at the similarity of concepts across languages, and they use a variety of data sources, um, we can get an embedding distance. And if we actually look at the similarity of the category systems between English and Chinese populations, we actually see that increasing population size is, is systematically increasing the semantic similarity of the categories that they adopt in the embedding space, as we see considerable distance among the dyads. So in conclusion, um, if we think about the cognitive implications, right? The main argument was that we see individual category formation for novel stimuli is diverse, hard to predict, and that it doesn't lead to cross-group category similarity, at least not on its own. Sociologically speaking, we see that category formation in social networks follows predictable dynamics, which is actually contrary to much of the core argument of social constructivism and that actually increasing diversity by group size can systematically increase cross-group category similarity. So what I wanna leave you with today is a thought about the origins of cross-group category similarity and the argument that I'm making, which based on my understanding is it's somewhat of a novel point to be introducing into this space, is that uh, coordination dynamics, social dynamics can actually on their own generate consistent trajectories in the construction of shared category systems. They interact with cognitive salience, but they both need each other to produce this outcome. So in terms of the broader argument of uh, what could possibly explain this commonality, my point is uh, psychobiology is not the only thing that people are bringing with them no matter where they go. They actually bring communication networks. They're the foundation of organizations, of society. Every human society we've ever known has them. And dynamics of these communication networks can actually play a key role in supporting these cross-cultural regularities. And what I think is really important to recognize that is that is amid cognitive diversity. We can actually have variation, cognitive variation between people and nevertheless observe macro level regularities as a function of these uh, communication dynamics. So what I want to just point to is, uh, and then I'd love to open it up for discussion, is just some current work I'm doing. Like one is extending this into the context of crowdsourcing, where actually I'm looking at the discovery of new scientific concepts. So this is a great example of the crowdsourcing platform Zooniverse, where people are volunteer online to classify different uh, shapes, because basically we have many more images of space than we have people who can go through it. So you get volunteers. There's this amazing thing where these volunteers on the internet actually discovered a new kind of star called the Green Peak Galaxy that didn't exist in uh, astrophysics before um, just by coordinating. And they used an analogy by basically referring to it as a green pea. Um, this actually has since become the basis for plenty of scientific publications. It is now considered an existing uh, star, which I just think is the coolest thing ever. Um, and I also have applied this into the context of crowdsourcing for content moderation, where people actually have to agree on how to classify controversial content online, decide whether or not to take it down. This paper is uh, currently under review. It's basically the same logic, but applied into the space of content moderation. And uh, as the note of topology, I'm actually taking my work in the direction of thinking about different network structures that actually alter this categorization analogy formation process. I have some prior work looking at the effects of network structure on the spread of contagions or complex contagions and categories have been shown to spread like a complex contagion. So I'm excited to tell you about that work. And these are just some of the questions of network structure that I'm currently exploring. So brokers, people who belong between different network communities, are they more likely to generate novel categories? There's some basis for that in the network literature. Do hierarchical social networks produce more hierarchical category systems? There's some arguments for that in the sociological literature. 
that I'm exploring. And then just in general, I talked about cognitive diversity here, but I'm really interested in demographic diversity, the available, the availability of identity signaling and group dynamics and how that shapes category formation, say like the bias towards forming categories within group rather than between groups. So these are the sorts of dynamics that I'll be exploring. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate you all sticking with me through that. And I'm, I'm sorry, if the, I, I think one of the people in my building started making loud noise. I hope you didn't hear that. If you did, I hope it wasn't too distracting. Um, so thank you all so much. <laughs>